Good morning, Saints. Let us settle our spirits and our minds, turning them to Christ, turning to the Lord's business at hand. And as we do so, begin to quiet our spirits that the Spirit of God may speak to us as he called us to his table, which is a means of, means of grace along with the means of grace of the Word of God in prayer. As we come to this morning, remind you that uh, we're a church that observes close communion. That is, you're required to be a Christian to take of the Lord's table. Close, you do not have to be a church member to partake of the table. You are invited if you're a born-again believer and have uh, testified to that by being baptized according to the Scriptures. So you're welcome to you this morning. So as we come this morning, I ask the congregation to stand and for the pastors to come forward and the deacons to come forward in our call to worship. Lord, we thank you this day and your many blessings, Lord. And it's good to be in your house with your people. And Lord, I pray you just uh, bless us from your word this morning, Lord, just uh, that we'd set our hearts and our eyes on you, Lord. And I pray you just bless our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please repeat with me the call to worship. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass, flowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Four oh seven.
This child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I. Just because he lives, and then one day I'll cross the river, I'll buy life's no war with pain, and the last day is way to And life is worth the living just because he lives. Thank you, Steve. Good to see your smiling faces this morning in these perilous times of uh, experiencing what the wrath of God being poured out begins to look like on an unbelieving world. Of course, we are not immune uh, because as believers, we live in this world and we stand giving testimony to Christ as the faith that we have and that uh, Christ has covered us with his righteousness and we come this morning because we're in him and we're be not afraid. If you're a guest in our service this morning, we're really happy that you're here. You should find one of these little cards in the seat pocket in front of you. If you will fill it out this morning, give us a record of your visit. And if you just place this in the offering box in the rear wall as you leave, it give us a record of your, of your visit. I'd just like to send you a personal note of welcome. But if you're seeking Christ, if you're seeking communion with his saints, you're always welcome here at Country Estates Southern Baptist Church. Now, page number 514. Shall the 
number 572. I'd love to tell the story. It's time that we come to God in prayer, thanking him for his gift of grace to the church and his continuing gift of grace and his provision for us as his saints. And as we do so, we want to remember those prayer requests that the congregation needs to lift before him. Greg, great to see you this morning, sir. How you doing? Thank you for your prayers, everyone. And how's the rest of the family doing? Okay. 
So we just need to continue to lift up the Hodgson family in all of its varied forms wherever they are, right? We will. All right. Uh, we need to pray for Kiyoki this morning. He, st he stood firm, doing the right thing, paying a little bit of the price for that. Just pray for a grace for him and for Sonia. Please continue to do that uh, and see what God does in, in and through him and, and with him. So please pray for Kiyoki. What other things should we bring to the Lord in prayer about this morning? Yes, uh, Lou, Doc. Well, that is a praise. You feel all, you feeling all right? Okay. Okay. We'll do that. Others? Yes, uh, Ruby. You sound like a rancher. Amen, sister. Amen. Jeff. For the corn family, yes. Kathy. Getting close to applying for German citizenship. Yes. Uh, Jay. Hmm. Where do you hear that? Others. And Pearl. Thank you. Alice. Yes, Kathy. And, uh, mm -hmm. Helping with the kids. JJ. Appointment coming up. We pray for that. Robert, she has it tomorrow. Kind of goes along with the sermon. Listen carefully. Physical courage is one thing. Moral courage is quite another. So that's probably what we're talking about. The moral courage to do what he thinks is right for the moment. Yes, Alan. We thank God for that, then. We will. All right? Will you take a moment and just go before the Lord? Let you settle your mind a moment. I'll lift these things up as I pray a pastoral prayer as well. O oh Lord Christ, thou art present with thy people. 
Hear our hearts, O oh God. We ask you, Lord, to give us a deeper repentance, a horror of sin, and fear its approach in our lives. Help us to flee sin and resolve that our hearts will be yours alone. Give us a deeper trust so we may lose ourselves and find ourselves in you and in you alone. Therefore, grant us a deeper knowledge of yourself, our Savior, Lord, King, and High Priest. Grant us a deeper power in prayer, more delight in your word, and a greater grasp upon your truth. O oh Lord, give us a deeper holiness in speech, thought, and action. And O oh Lord, restrain us to seek moral virtue that we not do that apart from you. We have no Lord but you. We have no delight but you. We have no law but your will. We have no wealth but that which you have already given us. We do not have any peace but what you grant by your Spirit. We have nothing but that which comes from your gracious hand. Therefore, Lord, enlarge our souls and fill us with living water that the roots of your grace spread throughout us like a living plant. We pray for the needs of the church this morning beyond these, Lord, for the personal needs. Lord, one of these points where we need the Spirit to intercede with us in accordance with what? So we thank you that Greg is here this morning. We pray for the entire Hodgson family concerning the death of the matriarch of the family, his mother. Lord, thank you for his faithfulness and Robin's faithfulness all along in this long journey. What a marvelous person she was and is. And Lord, we're, we're blessed to know she is with you. We pray for our brother Kiyoki this morning, faced with a particular trial. He stood firm, Lord, in paying some consequences. Lord, we pray for continued strength and grace for both he and Sonia. Lord, so we pray also, and thank you. The doc is here, and we pray for his healing, his continued healing. For Ruby, as we give thanks for the grass that your rain caused to grow, and for her sister-in-law who has a foot infection, Lord, we pray for your grace for her and healing if it be thy will. For the Corn family that continues to struggle with health issues, Lord, we ask for your strength, your grace to, to work through that. May as your spirit intercede for them. I know he will intercede in accordance with your will and purpose. We pray for Audrey Maypoles. Lord, it was her birthday. We remember her. She's a part of our family. We pray, Lord, for a return in your time. We pray for Jay's uncle, Lord, who's lost a stepson, obviously unexpectedly. Lord, the grief that is theirs, we pray for your peace and your comfort. We pray for Amparo. She remembers the death of a cousin as she told me, the last of her cousins. Lord, we pray for peace for her family. We pray for Ed and Trudy Smith as they minister to their family in Phoenix, taking care of the, the kids while the parents um, suffer both from COVID. We pray for our brother JJ, a, a successful cardiology appointment so he might have his other surgery. We pray for our brother Robert and his wife Regina, particularly her surgery coming up tomorrow. Lord, you would bring healing and relief from the pain as a male care that she suffers. And Lord, we pray as we are commanded to pray for our president, vice president, Lord, President Trump and Vice President uh, Pence, Lord, in their leadership and guidance over the nation. It is clear to me, at least personally, Lord, I could be wrong, but you have already declared in Romans 1 that the whole world is underneath thy wrath. It is clear to me you have lifted 
your hand of restraint on the lawlessness in our nation. Lord, we thank you for your common grace. The world is not as bad as it could be. But Lord, we can see what can happen when lawlessness and chaos has its way. And so we pray for particular moral courage for our leaders to do what they think is best for the nation and not for themselves or for anybody else. Lord, that courage, we pray. And Lord, we thank you for Alan and his involvement at the Warriors Healing Center and a particular, uh, a particular healing of a man by the name of Jonathan, Jonathan and the grace you've given him. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we come before you, having already know that you will provide for us every need of ours in every way. Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, knowing that we're in the school of prayer at all times, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Believing that God will provide every need of ours in Christ, let us stand and praise him by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Last week in John 18, we examined our Lord's arrest in the garden. And so we follow that particular text with John 18, 19 through 27, which is my theme text this morning, which I've entitled Three Denials and a Slap. Three Denials and a Slap. These are the words of the Lord inspired by the Holy Spirit. And remember when we're looking at the Word of God, so we're looking at the Holy Spirit's uh, arrangement of the elements in the Word for a particular reason, message, and purpose. And we're going to do our best this morning to kind of discover that as we look at this text. This is the Word of the Lord. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded, oh, by the way, he wasn't the high priest, Jesus is. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, aren't you aren't one of his, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. At that moment, a rooster began to crow. Here we have on display the excellencies of our Savior positioned against the darkness and the evil intents of his enemies. But interwoven into this incident 
we have an account of the fall of one of Jesus' disciples, who although he was physically courageous, he cut off the servant's ear, he was impulsive, he had self-confidence, but he failed to pray as Jesus directed. And therefore, he lacked the moral courage to stand with Christ during his trial. This account serves as a cautionary tale to all of us, to warn us that we also are vulnerable to denying our Lord before his enemies. We live in a world today that is just as hostile to Christ and his gospel as they were then. And if we are to be faithful disciples, we must be willing to stand firm with him in the advance of the gospel and his mission. And that mission is to save for God a people in whom God dwells by his spirit. If that is so, then we must also be ready not only to stand courageously physically, but morally. And the temptation to bend the knee, to equivocate, to try to blend in so that we escape that kind of scrutiny is very tempting. But in effect, it's a denial of the Lord. We must be willing to publicly identify ourselves as a follower of Jesus Christ and to do it unashamedly and courageously. Let me read the rest of the text, John 18, verses 12 through 27. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. The, book, the Gospel of Matthew says Peter was following at a distance in him. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. Providence had given Peter a closed door. It would have been better if Peter would have observed that. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples, too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. Painful, isn't it? Painful to read that. It was cold. Pay attention to these little details. And the servants and officials stood around the fire they had made to keep warm. The enemies of Christ are always willing to keep you warm if you stand out in the cold with him. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself, while his Savior was cold. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, all this was going on, Peter was still standing there warming himself. Where should Peter have been? Ask yourself the question. Aren't you one of his disciples too, aren't you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. At that moment, a cock began to crow. In our text, the Holy Spirit supplies details concerning Jesus' arrest and subsequent trials 
that are not given by the other gospel writers. We should expect that from John. John passes over our Lord's appearing before Caiaphas and covers his appearance before Annas. Our text begins with Jesus being led away bound and taken before Annas while the Holy Spirit then pauses in this to detail the involvement of Peter who followed along at a distance entering the high priest's house. And after recording Peter's first denial, Peter is left warming himself before a fire. This is followed by the encounter between Jesus and Annas. And the Holy Spirit then turns our attention again back to Peter and his denial of Christ for the third time. I ask myself this question as I looked at this text. Why has the Holy Spirit given this much space to Peter's denial of Jesus more than the Lord's trial before Annas? Why? Is it not, Lord, uh, beloved, to demonstrate how much we need His grace at each moment of our Christian life? How important it is, it, is it for us to be reminded that acting out of our self-confidence or strength is to invite spiritual disaster? And when I speak of self-confidence, I'm not talking about the confidence of a carpenter in cutting a straight cut on timber. I'm not talking about the confidence of an athlete to hit a fallaway jumper in the last two seconds of the game. I'm not talking about that kind of confidence. I'm talking about the self-confidence that I got this lick, Lord. I can handle this. I can face this on my own. Beloved, you can't and I can't. Given the world that we live in and the dangers that continue to increase, we need the Lord's confidence, confidence in Christ and a constant seeking of his grace. This is why we come and, and, and celebrate the means of grace that God has given us that God imbues grace into these things when they're practiced by faith. If you're a non-believer, they don't mean anything to you. But by faith, the realities of what these things symbolize concluded with the word of God and prayer and whatever fellowship we had this morning is the means of grace that God has given us as a church in order to supply God's saints with the grace we need. Because, beloved, let me tell you something. Grace is also power. Grace is also power. Yes, it's comfort. Yes, it's peace. Yes, it's perseverance. But it's also power to stand firm. And you and I need God's grace to stand firm in these days. And so I divide this text this morning into three sections. As we look at this table, think of what we're invited to participate. As Christians, we acknowledge Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. We acknowledge his willing obedience to the Father. And by faith in him, we receive his obedience, his righteousness, that enables us to walk in this life with him with confidence in Christ, not ourselves. You know what the Apostle Paul said? I place no confidence at all in the flesh, and I would suggest we don't either. And so as we look at this, I divide this text into three sections based upon the changing emphasis of the Holy Spirit in each section. So let's now examine, firstly, Peter's first denial. Peter's first denial, we see in John 18, 12 through 18, we see that, uh, that Simon Peter wanted to know what was happening to Jesus. Do you believe Simon Peter anticipated the moral stress he was going to be placed under when he followed our Lord, wanting to see what was going on. And I believe he desired the first to support him. Did Peter anticipate the moral courage he would need at that moment? Do you believe he did? I don't believe he did at all. 
And part of the problem is those tests come upon us suddenly. And therefore, we must be prepared. We must have the things of Christ cemented in our mind and our heart before they happen. If you wait until the test, you're going to be more likely to fall. Did Peter realize he was going to be forced or he was going to be put in a position to either affirm or deny his followership of Christ? I don't think he did. I don't think he did. So as we look at this, and the other disciple, we don't know who this other disciple is, by the way. Some people say it's John, but it can't be John. Uh, and so uh, they go into the high priest courtyard. We notice something right away. First of all, we notice among the arresting officials, they were compromised of a very diverse crowd. We have Jews, Gentiles, soldiers, servants of the priests and the Pharisees, as well as some of the Lord's covenant people. Different as they were, they all had one thing in common. They were all blind as to the person they had just arrested. This party had all witnessed Jesus' mercy and power when he healed the servant's ear. Hello, who in the world do you think you're arresting? Yet they remained unmoved. Isn't that right with the world? They remain unmoved unless God the Spirit calls them. I find it ironic that Jesus stands here under judgment by those who will one day stand before him. Those who judge Jesus falsely will also experience his truthful judgment upon them. And there's only one way to escape judgment, beloved and that is to bow your knee to Christ, believing him to be the Son of God, that he was crucified for your sins, raised on the third day. And by faith in him, you can be forgiven of all of those things and be clothed in his righteousness and be given the gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell you and to help you to live the Christian life. Because, beloved, we can't live the Christian life on our own, can we? We can't. Oh, the wonder of Christ's passive obedience. Now, what is passive obedience? He allowed these things to happen to him because he was actively obedient to the Father. We must never forget the wonder of Christ's submission, not because he was helpless, but because his heart was on saving sinners like you and me. Like Joseph, oh, how Joseph was a type of Christ. In Psalm 105, 17 and 18, we have this recorded in the Psalms. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Why did they feel the need to bind our Lord? Jesus had just told Peter to put away his sword. Surely they realized that Jesus was not bent on insurrection. He met them at the entrance to the garden. He's willingly submitting to them. You know why they bound him? To fulfill the type in the Old Testament of Isaac. Let me read to you Genesis 22, 9, who was the type of Christ offered by Abraham. When they reached the place God had told about him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. There may be another reason he was bound. Because Jesus was taking our place in who are we, people who are bound in sin. And so taking our place, he too, was also bound so that he could free us as our substitute. He was bound so we could be loosed. On his way to Annas' house, Jesus would pass through the sheep gate. This gate is the gate through which the sheep who were being sacrificed would be led to the altar. 
fitly so entered the true Lamb of God. But you know, beloved, there's also the contrast between the two Adams. The first Adam was driven out of the garden while Jesus was led. Both Annas and Caiaphas were high priests at the same time. In the eyes of the Jews, Annas was the preferred high priest because Caiaphas was appointed by Rome. This accounts for them taking Jesus to Annas first. The Holy Spirit also reminds us that Caiaphas was the one who already decided that Jesus would, should die. Therefore, we should not expect a real trial. Matthew 26, 58 tells us that Peter followed them at a distance. Oh, beloved, what an application that is for us. It is so tempting when mingled in with the world and mingled in with the crowd around the fire, mocking our Lord to follow him at a distance. Oh, please don't find out I'm a Christian. Oh, please don't find out I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter followed him at a distance. Physical cowardice or moral cowardice or both? What say you? We must also remember that Jesus told the arresting party to let the disciples to go their own way. Wasn't Peter listening? Wasn't that a hint? Peter, get out of here. Did not our Lord tell Peter in the garden, unless he watched and prayed, he would fall under temptation? Do you think the Lord knew what he was talking about? Of course he did. If Peter would have listened to that, Listen to Jesus telling him to pray. Listen to Jesus telling him, Peter, go your own way. I got you out of here. But then we would have been liable to say that Peter was a coward. He didn't follow the Lord. But the Lord told him to scram, protecting his disciples. Well, Peter didn't take the hint. Many have said it was John, the other disciple. However, Acts 14, 13 makes it clear the high priest was not familiar with Peter or John. Peter, because he was unknown, had to wait outside initially. There was a closed door. You and I talk about closed doors all the time. Sometimes those closed doors are there because they're closed by God. You think if Peter would have stayed outside, he would have fell? No. At least he wouldn't have denied the Lord the way he did. The Lord in the garden had warned them to watch and pray. This is the second time Peter ignored the Lord's words. Application coming. We ignore the Lord's words at our peril. We observe that Peter was first challenged by a woman whose question is not in any way harsh. But we're surprised by Peter's cowardice in his response to the woman. Judas betrayed the Lord out of covetousness. Peter betrays the Lord out of moral cowardice. Which one was worse? In verse 18, we also see that Peter was cold. Oh, poor Peter. He was cold. What about our Lord who is standing in that cold place? Did you not think of him? The Christian who follows Christ afar off at a distance can also expect soon to grow cold. How closely do you follow Christ? And the enemies of Christ, oh, beloved, in that company, the enemies of Christ will be happy to provide the warmth that will warm up your coldness. Peter, let's say, face it, told a lie. It's important for us to see these words. Here's the words. Pay attention. Peter was standing where? Read the text. Where was Peter standing? With them. 
Who are you standing with this morning? Who are you standing with? The apostles stood among the enemies of Christ just as Judas did in John chapter 8, verse 5. Look it up. Judas was standing with them when they arrested Jesus. Peter tried to hide and blend in to be unnoticed. How true is Proverbs 14, 14? The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways and the good rewarded for theirs. How important, how critical is it that we participate, participate in the means of grace that God offers us so that we will not fail, that we will not deny him. And there are many ways to deny him publicly. So now we move on to the second kind of scene, the Inquisition. John 18, 19 through 24. Notice the high priest questioned Jesus first about his disciples. What would he want to know about the disciples? What kind of people were they if they were rebels or criminals or insurrectionists? Do you think he would make hay of that? I do. But what is evident here, Annas tries to get Jesus to incriminate himself. Annas's question concerning his disciples was an attempt to make Jesus' followers a bunch of ne'er-do-wells as evidenced how by their failure to be with him instead of with them. What a mock, the mocking question it was. As to his doctrine, it is clear they didn't have to charge a level against him. They didn't know what to charge him with. The fact that he gathered disciples means Jesus may be open to a charge of insurrection against Rome. But considering the question as to his doctrine, they are trying to trap him in a blasphemy. Our Lord's reply in verse 20 reminds them that he has spoken openly to the world, to whoever will listen. There are plenty of witnesses. If Annas would bother to call one, notice Annas did not call any witnesses. This is one of those traps to get a person to incriminate themselves. By affirming that he taught in established places of worship, gave proof that he was building no lawless sect. In saying that he said nothing in secret means he didn't have means he didn't have two messages. One for his disciples, secret message, oh, we're going to overthrow Rome, and another for the public. There was no secret messages. Frankly, this is a fulfillment of Scripture. You probably knew I was going there. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 45 to 19. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. It's amazing. It's amazing the things about Christ you find in the Old Testament. We also need to notice that Jesus didn't say a word about his disciples. He didn't take the bait. As the shepherd, he was protecting the sheep because he alone was going to suffer, not they. His answer in verse 21 challenges their assertion of a lack of knowledge of his doctrine. They were not ignorant of his teaching, and most have even heard him preach in person. There was no need to arrest him at night, except as a cover for their malice and dishonesty, their lawlessness. How does, beloved, verse 22 and 23 manifest man's hostility to God? 
You notice there was no rebuke from Annas for the slap, which was unlawful. This blow upon Christ was actually the first at the hands of sinners. And as I've said, the scriptures must be fulfilled. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. How in the world does God weave the truth of what's going to happen to Jesus all the way back through the, through the words of the prophets? And the actions of Abraham and Isaac? Oh, you mean God has a decree? Oh, that's true. God has a decree. But we also marvel at Christ practicing what he taught. Notice he did not strike back. He turned the other cheek. What a temptation this could have been for him. Yet he is without sin. I do wonder this. In a kind of a voyeur way, I would like to be standing there with this person who slapped him as he stands before Christ in judgment. And he looks upon the one he slapped. Maybe he actually becomes a Christian and is saved. We would hope that, wouldn't we? We would. And so Annas was at a loss. He couldn't get anything out of Jesus. So he proceeds further. So he turns Jesus over to Caiaphas. Who's the real high priest here? We now turn our attention to Peter's second and third denial in John 18, 25 through 27. We see Peter still standing there. He was challenged. I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a man challenged him, Worm, didn't I see you with him? Now get this. Look at that with him. Didn't I see you with him? Peter said, what? Denied being what? With him? And the decree of God in the crowing of the rooster happened. Peter still standing by the fire. Peter's features were lit up by the fire, which enabled the next questioner to ask his question. And Peter flatly denies their question. It was the kinfolk of the man whose ear Peter had cut off who challenged him. The man saw at one point Peter standing with Jesus and now Peter is standing with them. Now the immediate application for us is this, to be careful to avoid the company of those who would mock Jesus. That's the unequally yoked thing. Be extremely careful. I know with jobs and things like that you're going to be around people who aren't a Christian such as you. But to be careful, even though you do that, you're not standing with them in spirit. Yes, you can do that. You can be a Christian in the military. You can be a Christian working at a home for kids. You can be a Christian as a secretary at a school. You can be a Christian as a teacher. You can be a Christian. Standing with Christ even when others around you are not. I'm sure we need to take a look at Peter's denial. Let me ask it this way Did Peter deny that Jesus was God? Did he? No. Did Peter deny that he was Israel's Messiah? No. What did he deny? That he was one of his followers. It was a public disavowal. 
You remember what Jesus said, those who deny me before men, he will I deny before my father. This is dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. All boasting about our own strength is indeed a weakness. How, beloved, does this not demonstrate? How, unless at each moment we're at, we're, unless we're held up by grace, we shall all fall. All boasting about our strengths are indeed weaknesses. And how about God? Did God create that rooster for that moment? Of course he did. How strange was Peter's fall. We can all admit he was a man of personal courage. In his actions of wanting to defend the Lord at the cost of his own life, who can say that he was a coward there? But how does that change in the flash of an eye in a moment? where someone who's willing to fight for the Lord and to give his life subsequently in their moments say, I'm not one of his followers. How does that happen? One of the things that I previously mentioned, you think Peter anticipated his need for moral courage? don't think so. Beloved application, you and I must always be willing to anticipate an ongoing need for moral courage in our day. You go into a gay wedding? Do you affirm gay marriage? Or do you work in a place where people do? Are you afraid to say anything? Probably. That might get you fired. Are you willing to stand with Christ on all of these things that are trouble our, our nation today? Or are you going to try to hide in the background? Peter's fall is indeed disconcerting. You know why? On a scale of physical courage, Peter was probably just as courageous as the most courageous military veteran or nurse, or doctor, who, who ministers with his patient that has COVID. How come moral courage is a different thing? It's a different kind of courage. And I'll tell you why. Because unless you really believe what you say you're standing on, you're not going to have it. Beloved, you've got to decide, if you haven't already, and I believe you all have, you've got to decide now where you stand. Because this is going to be challenged. And you must be ready for those challenges. This applies to you young people. It applies to those in school, in college to those in the work world, to those in the ministry. Can you believe I said that? Can you imagine all the mocking pastors who stand upon the truth receive from their liberal counterparts? Come on. You don't really believe Jesus rose from the dead, do you? Yes, I do. Let me finish this way as we come to the table. By emphasizing the means of grace we receive from partaking in obedience to Christ's command. Beloved, this is something you need. Being under the authority of the preaching of the word of God is something we need. Being a praying Christian, both individually and corporately, is something we need. By being a part of the fellowship of the saints is something we need. Don't be the person who says, I don't need any, because you will fall. 
And so we have in this text the contrast of physical and moral excellency of our Savior, contrast with the evil of his enemies, the malice on display of both the religious and the secular world, and the dangers of standing with Christ's enemies in any way. And we also see the need for both physical and moral courage as Christ's followers. Our need for both types of courage is only increasing in our day. And we should not be surprised who it is that fails the testing. And finally, what a merciful and faithful high priest we have. The same hand that plucked Peter out of the water as he was drowning is the same hand that will give him grace after his fall. So, beloved, if you fall, don't give up. Turn to our master who freely forgives. Turn to him confessing sin and our weaknesses and asking for the grace he's willing to give us. If he graced Peter, who believed, he'll also grace you. So let's be a people who participates and partakes of God's grace in all of its various means, learning from him as he strengthens us, as we walk the Christian life, as we struggle living in the world that we live. And may God add to this wisdom as we live under his lordship and not denying his name. Amen? Yeah. Let us approach the table of the Lord. Will the deacons and pastors come? Are you ready to take about take some grace?